I mailed out 14,000 postcards. I did 27 deals off of that. I did enough deals that that one year to pay off you know, my student loans from college and law school. And so we used to buy houses in Five Points downtown on a credit card, like $7,000, $8,000 and flip them for 15. Those are worth four to 500 now. Downtown Denver, before they put the ball field in, was garbage. And when the oil market busted in the 80s in Denver, a lot of people just ran. The market was just starting to come back in the early 90s when I got here. 2000, I was approached by a publisher to write a book, which was called Flipping Properties, before all the TV shows. I should have trademarked the term, probably. <laughs> but that became a bestseller and you know, printed in three languages and I uh, did very, very well. I had my website up early in 97, legalwiz.com. You have to change your pace, your volume, your tone and your style about every three minutes. Otherwise, no matter what, if you're really loud, you'll engage them, but their brain will go to sleep after three minutes of listening, or if you're really soft, you have to change it constantly. The pace, the tone, the volume, your body language, the style, it has to constantly change, otherwise you lose the audience. Welcome to the Colorado Springs Business Podcast, where we discuss business principles and provide real life insight into the lives of everyday business owners and entrepreneurs. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe or leave a review wherever you might be listening. Now, let's talk business. We interrupt this program to bring you our sponsors, the people who help make this show possible. Dope Tees. Dope Tees is one of our fresh new sponsors that we have for you today. Dope Tees is here to help level up your style game. They're all about killer designs and top notch quality. Seriously, go check them out. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing Dope Tees right now. This is a tee that I'm wearing that is a dope tee. Episode of the founder and owner of Dope Tees is coming up soon. Be on the lookout. Or it's already here. So go find it. Thank you, Dope Tees, for supporting us and helping us do what we do here at the COS Business Podcast. Curious? Head over to Dope Tees' website right now. That's www.dopeteez.biz. B-I-Z. That's www.dope. T-E-E-Z. Yes, check it out. Franchise, Franchise Succeed. Succeed. Franchise Succeed brings a wealth of knowledge to the table, boasting a team of over six decades of combined experience in franchising and financial planning. They specialize in helping business owners elevate their companies through franchising. What sets them apart? Expertise in multiple industries. Whether you're in retail, finance, or energy exploration, they've got you covered. Tailored strategies. They work closely with their clients to understand the unique needs and goals, developing customized investment plans. Ethical approach. Integrity and ethics are at the core of their operations, ensuring they work with only the best and most qualified partners. They can help you. From customer service policies to million-dollar marketing programs, they've got the expertise. If you're thinking about franchising your business or need strategic guidance, look no further. That's FranchiseSucceed.com. FranchiseSucceed.com. Our next sponsor is a company I like to call, and they like to call themselves too, Planet, Planet Duct. Duct. If you're in Colorado Springs and surrounding areas and you haven't heard of Planet Duct, you're missing out. They're not just any air duct cleaning company service. They're NADCA NADCA certified specialist. Here's what sets them apart. Powerful equipment. Their team is highly trained to give your air ducts a cleaning that is literally out of this world. Comprehensive cleaning. From blowing the dust from your duct vents to cleaning the truck lines, they've got it all covered. They even clean the return drop blower wheel and filter compartment. Safety checks. After all that cleaning, they do a free carbon monoxide check to ensure your system is safe. Time efficient. Depending on your home size and project scope, they typically take about three to five hours to get the job done, and they get it done right. So if you're looking to breathe a little easier, give Planet Duck a call. Trust us, your lungs will thank you. Visit their website for more information at planetduck.com. Our next sponsor is Recon Marketing. And you know what? I'm going to tell you why Recon Marketing rocks. Their expertise. They know the ins and out of marketing like the back of their hand. They have many of years of experience in doing this, and you can trust them. Free consultations. Not sure if they're a right fit? They offer a free consolation to help you decide. And if that wasn't enough, the co-host of this episode today right now is Marcus Alvarado, who is the founder of Recon Marketing. Custom solutions. Every business is unique, and Recon Marketing tailors their services to meet your specific needs. Results driven. They focus on delivering real measurable results. So connect with them today. Get your free consultation today at reconmarketingservices.com. That's reconmarketingservices.com. So now we're going to dive into this amazing episode. All right, welcome back to the COS Business Podcast. We have a very special guest today. We have Mr. Bill Bronchick. Mr. He's an author, entrepreneur, speaker, musician. I know you told me to only introduce him with a couple of things, but there's so much that you do. 
um, attorney as well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is great. I'm so excited. You're a good friend of mine. Um, you're married into a family that I'm very close to, um, Jen Wynn, um, and just become a really good dear friend of mine for a long time now. I think at least a year now. And uh, it's so good to have you on the show. Tell us a little bit more about who you are and your story. Um, there's so much to cover today. You do a lot. You're yeah. a very busy man, but let's start from the very oh, beginning. Bill Bronchek. Yep. <laughs> the complex nature of this personality. <laughs> Just joking. Um, well, um, by trade, I'm an attorney. Um, been practicing for 32 years, primarily in uh, real estate business, um, tax and estate planning, and asset protection. Uh, that's pretty much the 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 limit of my practice. I found that a jack of all trades is a master of none, yeah. especially in the law practice. So I, I've fallen into real estate mostly because I've been a real estate investor for 30 years as well. My mom was a real estate investor and um, you know, kind of wrote me into the business. And uh, I've done that ever since. You know, in the beginning, I, I said, wow, look at this. I graduated law school. I can charge, you know, three or four hundred dollars an hour. 40 hours a week, it's a license to steal, right? But the problem with that model is you run out of hours when you're not working, you're not earning. So it doesn't matter whether it's you know $40 an hour or 400 an hour. Um, I've upped it to 475 now. Um, you run out of hours. And I really hate working by the hour. When someone wants to consult with me for an hour, even though 475 sounds like a lot, but yeah. It's not a good use of my time. It's not a good leverage of my time. Sure. So I got into real estate because I saw the value of money coming in while I'm not working, or if I don't work, if I can't work, and so on and so forth. And you really leverage your time into that. And then um, I, I grew up in New York. I moved here in to Colorado in '93. Um, and the market was just ripe for real estate. I was killing. I did it full time for about three years. Um, then, um, we started a real estate investment club, like a professional organization for networking and to find deals and things like that. And then eventually, um, we started having seminars and I invited other speakers in and most of them were pretty bad. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, all this stuff, why don't you teach it? So I started teaching seminars and then, uh, around 2000, I was approached by a publisher to write a book, uh, which was called flipping properties, which is everyone knows before all the TV shows. Um, I should have trademarked the term probably. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Uh, but that became a bestseller and, you know, printed in three languages and I uh, did very, very well. I've written five published books since um, and on real estate and business. And, uh, you know, I fell into doing seminars and speaking and writing. And I had my website up early in 97, legalwiz.com. Um, and, you know, I, I teach with a sort of legal uh, angle of real estate investing, you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's and so forth, doing things legally and correct, which most investors don't. Um, and um, so, I, you know, I've got my, my law practice still. I've got my, my, my uh, investment properties. Um, and then I have my seminars and books and speaking that I do. And then when I squeeze a little time here and there, golf, martial arts, and um, and the uh, uh, musician thing. So you know, about once a month, I play in a rock and roll band with some some old guys like me, and we have a lot of fun. Well, let's unpeel some of those layers because there's a lot there. But um, how did you get so? I'm assuming it was a lot of repetition for the speaking piece, right? Or were you already pretty inherently good at well, speaking publicly? Uh, you know, as a musician and I was, you know, I started playing guitar when I was seven. Wow. So I, I was playing in bars by the time I was 14, <laughs> yeah. back when the drinking age was 18, uh, got away with it. And so I was used to like being on a stage. So I wasn't really uh, uncomfortable with public speaking. Um, you know, I started out okay, but when I, you know, I in, in law school, I did um, something called moot court where you do oral arguments and in front of judges and things like that. So I had some practice at that. But really, it was just a matter of just speaking a lot. I, I travel all over the country speaking at real estate investment clubs like mine all over the country, and just about every major city has one. So I, you know, after fifty or sixty times of doing it, then I really got comfortable with it. Were there a lot of meetups? Like you said, you like the, one of the first things that you started in the first. You said, well, first, the first three years you were just doing real estate because mm -hmm. you said it was right for the picking. 
But then you said you started like developing like networking, like meetup mm-hmm. groups. Was that even a thing in the no, early nineties or mid nineties? It was. It was just we we actually put an ad in the in the classifieds that said uh, you know um, awesome. uh, apartment building no money down um, uh, seller will carry. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people called and we said, Hey, we don't have that anymore, but we're starting a real estate group. <laughs> if you awesome. want to, you know, at this hotel and we had meetings every month and, uh, you know, eventually it became online, um, as well. Uh, and before the 2008 crash, we used to get 500 people plus at our meetings every month. It was insane. Dang. And you could probably quarter that market in debt. So what yeah. was the environment? You said it was right for the picking back then in the nineties, but was was there a lot of prominent uh, real estate folks here that you had to like kind of, you know, kind it of was, Shark Tank kind of deal or well, not really? It was it was, uh, it was coming out of the crash of the eighties. You know, when the oil yeah. market busted in the eighties in Denver, a lot of people just ran. So there was a lot of people who left properties behind that they rented out, and the market was just starting to come back in the early nineties when I got here. But the people who moved out of town didn't really know this. So right. I started by mailing letters and postcards to people who were out-of-state owners. Mm-hmm. And they were just, I, I, I mailed out 14,000 postcards and I did 27 deals off of that. Wow. Off of that one mail. 14,000 postcards cost? Yeah. Oh, uh, back then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was probably about 35 cents back then. So yeah, for all I was. Really yeah, it was really good. <laughs> I mean, it was like, uh, it probably cost me like 5,000. Yeah. You know, with the postage and- um I did enough deals that that one year to pay off, you know, my student loans from college and law school, and then so that's awesome. Yeah. Do you like? Um, because I'm coming in from the the marketing perspective. How are those? Do you still use some of those traditional marketing tactics, mm-hmm. like say, like direct mail or anything mm-hmm. like that? Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, anyone who's in marketing knows that anyone responds to a, a letter in the mail or a postcard is one of the best customers you'll ever have. Mm-hmm. That and people who call in radio shows mm-hmm. uh, or TV. Um, internet is cheaper and it's wider, but those tend to be weaker leads. Um, the problem is, is getting people to open the mail. <laughs> right. Most people sort their mail over the garbage. Um, so we do what's called a yellow letter, this is the most effective campaign, what looks like a handwritten mm-hmm. yellow pad letter uh, stuffed in an invitation envelope, not a number 10. Mm -hmm. Um, like pink or yellow with a stamp on it, handwritten addressee. And that gets open pretty, we get about, depending on the list we mail to, a one to 3% response, which is enough, which is enough. Psychologically, there's something there, right? Like there's something to be said about something more personalized in today's Mm -hmm. day and age. Obviously the internet, there's not much friction anymore with internet. That's access to everybody who doesn't have access to internet and at least the US, right? Mm -hmm. You, any, the 12 year old does, right? right? And that's why- Usually the qualified leads that come in through it is, I mean, it's the floodgates. You're going right. to get a lot, you know, um, but like intention with writing a personal letter and sending it to somebody and someone to, at least someone who's um, grown up with like personalized letters. It's so important to get like a personal letter from a friend right. or whatever. Right, right. And we do it, you know, we mail merge it with a, a handwriting font. It's not actually handwritten. Right, I know, yeah. Um, but nine out of 10 people can't know the difference. Mm-hmm. So it's dear Bob, I was happened upon your property at two thirty one Main Main Street, and so it's real specific to the to the property and the person. Yeah, how has um, I mean, there's so much that's changed in Colorado in the past thirty years. Oh yeah, talk a little bit about. That. I mean, obviously we're talking about two thousand eight. We're talking about the eighties and what happened. You know, would directly ref, uh, mm-hmm. affecting the real estate market from there. But like, how has the scape changed over the years, just in general for you? Well, it's just the floodgates of people uh, coming in. The population has increased so much. The prices, uh, I remember back in the early 90s, you know, downtown Denver before they put the ball field in was garbage. You know, there was, there was more homeless people in the street then, believe it or not, um, and buildings set for sale, lease, or trade uh, all over them. So we used to buy houses in five points downtown on a credit card, like $7,000 to $8,000 and flip them for fifteen. Uh, those are worth four to five hundred now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, yes. you know. And um, and and Denver was the model for urban revitalization. You know, putting money into the downtown and people moving back into the city, which was unheard of. I came from New York, and I grew up in you know in the suburbs in the seventies. And New York City was awful. It was just awful. Yeah, I've seen a documentary um, on that. Right until Giuliani <laughs> came along and cleaned it up. 
Um, you know, 42nd Street was a cliche about someone's mother. You know, <laughs> so uh, now 42nd Street is Disney, and, you know, high end uh, corporate stores. It's beautiful. I mean, there's almost not an inch of Manhattan that's not really nice and re revitalized. So I didn't see that coming, actually. People said they were building a ball field, you know, course field in Denver. And I said, so what? Right. Denver's a dump. Right. I didn't see this this trend that Denver started that happened all over the country with, you know, the, the downtown coming back and people moving out of the suburbs back into the city, mm -hmm. which now is starting to reverse again. Yeah. Because, right. Because, you know, because of COVID, because of, you know, Zoom and telecommuting, right. because of increased crime in, in, in cities, people are starting to move out again and even to suburbs and, and rural areas. And homelessness, I think, too. And homelessness is back. Yeah, because they just, you know, poor governing policies has led to, you know, a lot of homelessness, crime, drugs, and people say, look, I don't have to live three blocks from work. I only work two days a week at the office, so I could live, you know, 45 minutes away now. Right. Well, you can, um, you could take the boy out of, uh, or the man out of New York, but not the New York out of the man. <laughs> How has that influence helped you? Because I, the moment I met you, uh, I, one, I lived in New York for three years right. in the nineties and, uh. By the way, my mom was the executive newspaper industry and we we loved, that was like our favorite state we lived in just oh, because of the people and how straightforward they are, uh -huh. the family weren't, I mean, I loved hanging out with Italians. That's <laughs> best friend in first grade was named Vinny Michelli. I mean, oh, yeah. he was the best. Yeah. Uh, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm Jewish, but Jewish and Italian families are very much yeah. alike. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, the, the, the old joke is how do you tell the difference between a Jewish girl and an Italian girl? The nose chop. <laughs> 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 nice. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of Italian friends and, uh, you know, we got along real well cause our families were very similar. You get out of line, you get your butt kicked and you know. Yeah. How was that influence when you moved here? I mean, obviously with that kind of mentality, New York, their East coast mentality in Colorado, I mean. I'm totally different. Yeah. Totally different. You know, New Yorkers are very upfront, you know, in your face and, you know, of course a lot of colorful language. Um, it's it just the, you got used to a certain way of doing things where you wanted it now. You know, I call a business and expect a call back in half an hour. And I was frustrated here not being able to get that. Um, also, just the way, you know, the crooked things that were normal in New York, I just assumed were normal everywhere. So my first um, building inspector came to inspect one of my rehab homes. Uh, he says, well, you're going to have to do this, this and that. And I go, well, what's it going to cost me? Figuring, you know, how much do I have to give this guy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he goes, well, I don't know. You could probably hire a contractor. And I'm like, I don't think he got that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I was so used to people with their hand out, you know, right. even cops in New York were like that. You know, it was crazy. That's crazy. And so, I mean, you've been here for quite some time mm -hmm. now, right? Since yeah, the early nineties. Yeah. So this has been more than half my life now. Is this home? What's, yeah, what's home, home for you? This is home. That's awesome. This is home. I go back to New York, you know, a couple times a year. Got to get some good pizza, bagels. Can't get fine that here. Oh. Good Italian food. Yeah. You know, it's hard to find in Colorado. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I really love living here. Yeah. And the, all the family still over there in the East No, Coast. all my family, except for one brother, moves the all out. I have so half are in Florida, the other half are in California. Oh, man, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have some kiddos, too, there around. Yeah. Yeah, both my kids are, uh, uh, one of my daughters in the Navy intelligence. I don't know what she does. She can't tell me. Um, and my son just, just got out of the army as a medic and he's studying to become a uh, physician's assistant. Gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. And so are they like you, do they do a lot of different things too? Are they? Yeah. 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 They, they, they got, you know, um, their mom was, you know, from New York too. So yeah, they have that influence. That's crazy. Well, one thing that's one of my favorite things about you is you were saying like, a um, someone who's jack of all, all trades is a master of none of them right mm -hmm. um but you do have a lot of things that you do mm -hmm. how do you go through life and this might be something that mm -hmm. i mean you've been doing this for a long time mm -hmm. how have you been able to balance it how have these different things that you do talk to each other in a way that you're able to uh move through life and be successful in all those fronts it's uh it's tough it's tough to balance you know three different businesses and you know my family life and uh uh now two uh great steps sons that are teenagers that I'm spending a lot of time with mm -hmm. um and uh and the music thing and uh, I also play now in a in a worship band at church now on Sundays really <laughs> yeah so that's like another thing that I you know that I took on so it, it's it, it's a handful but you know 
uh, idle hands makes, you know, the, is the devil's playground. So they say, so I always keep busy. Yeah. I, and I always find this question so interesting because like I'm an entrepreneur who has different businesses and, um, I know the challenge of it. Mm. And I know also, it's also been a challenge to like find the right partner mm. to accept that yeah. version of me. That's yeah. always has a lot of people coming to them, always yeah. demanded in so many different areas at once and like sharing me with the world essentially. Yeah. yeah. And how, how's that journey been for you? I'm sure right. like, yeah. Right. Gary, my wife, Jenny, is just just a wonderful support and uh, encourages me to be the best I can be. Yeah. You know? And even in my business too, you know, I had a kind of set way of doing things. You know, I used to do uh, uh, a lot of YouTube videos with just a whiteboard and an iPhone. <laughs> That's it. And she went, oh, no, no, no. Lighting, makeup, cameras. <laughs> yeah. You got to really step it up a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, at first I was resistant, but- uh, and now I realize, all right, she's got something going here. You know, like, I got to step up my game a little bit. Yeah, YouTube's uh, evolved where that used to be okay. Like it still is. You can still do that like, and mm-hmm. still be successful with YouTube. But the mm-hmm. way YouTube has gotten to it, you have to have the good lighting, the good mic, the good- Right. Uh, you just got to make sure everything is up to par with the standards of the current right. range, I think. And that's that's good that she's helping you like push you to do that, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, she's been great with that. Yeah, and, and also- uh, cutting off customers and clients who are just uh, a drain. Mm. You know, just the, she just looked and she goes, you're too nice. People take advantage of you and your time. And uh, you got to really, you know, get rid of those people mm. in your life. And, and I did. And it was, it was great. It was great for my business. It was great for my sanity yeah. and my bottom line. Nice. One of the funniest things is that you're talking about New Yorkers being very straightforward and very blunt and, I know your wife and she mm-hmm. comes from that Vietnamese, Asian. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of Asians are very blunt and straightforward. Right, the right, <laughs> right, right. No, she's, she's, she's pretty much says what's on her mind. Yeah. <laughs> Which is sure. good. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It sounds like it's been a really good balance yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about this music thing. You've been doing it since you were seven years seven old. Seven years old. I saw the Beatles on TV. Yeah. And uh, the girls were, you know, it's like throwing their arms around them. And, they're, and I said, I want to be that. <laughs> yeah you know when i was seven i said oh i hate girls but i always like girls when I yeah um so i wanted that attention yeah so i started playing guitar and you know got really good at it early and uh you know played in high school and bands and college um wow. and law school um and i've been playing in the same band now uh with a group of folks who are great for about 12 years here in colorado that's awesome yeah well, it's cool because whenever I see a lot of your content out there, because we we follow some of your content, like mm-hmm. you'll have the outro with you playing right. guitar. Also, you know, <laughs> this man and it shows you doing like a really good because you're you're a really good guitarist. You. Like, I, I know you're humble about it, but like you're very talented. I, I just don't know how you've been able to find the time and be so great at all mm-hmm. these different things. I know you. It's definitely a passion for you and a creative right. outlet for you that you need. Yeah, it's definitely something. The music is 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 a must in my life. And martial arts too. Yeah, golf. Yeah, golf. Uh, haven't been playing a lot enough golf lately. Um, I used to, you know, belong to a couple of country clubs and play like three times a week. But you can't maintain a business, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> you can't have less than a ten handicap and have a business. It's yeah. Impossible. <laughs> um, so you know, there was a couple summers where I just kind of didn't work much, and I was a really good golfer. And now I'm just an average golfer and play maybe you know six times a year, um, mostly just to get out and walk and clear my head it's been an outlet for you to have and talk to clients because traditionally yeah. golf is like the the business sport yeah. right talk a little bit about that because like for a lot of our younger viewers that have, like watch the show that yeah maybe they're, they're in their golf or they're not but like there's something about oh, so golf great. that it has something to do with business and it clients does. and well, customers first of all it's you know minimum of three four hours yeah and if you're especially if you're riding around in a cart with someone you get such an opportunity to talk with them um and and get their perspective on things uh, um a uh, gentleman by the name of George Ross, you may know who, who was Trump's uh, um, lawyer and and vice president of the Trump Organization. He was on the show. Uh, he's since retired. He's in his 80s. Um, um, he spoke at a lot of my events, and I got to know him pretty well and got the opportunity to play golf with him wow. um, at uh, Trump National in uh, Jersey. And, you know, four hours in the cart and, and lunch, so just, just amazing stories that I got to hear about, you know, everything that goes on. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, you, you talk a lot during it. And it's funny thing is like, if they're not playing well, you get to see kind of how their personality reacts to yeah, yeah, having yeah. a bad day. Yeah. yeah. No, I, that's one thing I used to get, 
I used to be pretty bad. I used to break clubs and throw them <laughs> in the water and you know, but then I, I, I just it doesn't bother me anymore. Yeah. But when you had clients and stuff like that, did you use that kind of as a gauge of like maybe their temp? I, I played once with a guy who brought his friend who was a judge in Boulder, and this guy was the biggest jerk I've ever seen. I mean, really? He was throwing clubs and cursing and screaming, and and the people in front of us were slow, and that's one of the annoying things about golf, and the people in front of you are slow. And there's a guy who comes around who's called the marshal, and his job is to make sure people are yeah. moving along. And so there's this old guy, and the judge started going, well, you know, we've we've been behind these people for hours, and they're not moving. And he's like, well, sir, they paid too. He's like, well, you got to do your job. You can't be. And he starts screaming at the marshal. I'm like, what a jerk. What a jerk. Gosh, that's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Personalities come out, especially yeah. when they're, you know, I don't know. When motions are high, mm -hmm. a lot of the two true personalities come out, right? That's true. But pressure is on. You see who people really are. Yeah. That's a, that's a thing. And that's one thing that Michael Jordan, you know, has always said about the golf course. He's obviously like a mm -hmm. very... I mean, he that guy probably plays golf five times a week or more. Wow, know? good for him. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Did you watch that Last Dance documentary on uh, no, Jordan? No, not a good. Are you a Jordan fan or? Yeah, I okay. actually, I actually ran into him at a hotel in nice. Santa Barbara. Um, he was doing some kind of like youth camp th uh, there, and he was at the bar. I'm like, that's Michael Jordan. We go over and say hi. You know, so yeah, yeah. Why not shoot your shot, man? Yeah, I said, hey, you know, big fan. You know, yeah. Just had a quick conversation. Oh, that's cool. Well, God. Yeah. That documentary, I mean, a, a lot of, I guess, dr people who are striving for more, but even people who are established entrepreneurs, successful people love that documentary because it talks about mm -hmm. his perseverance in that last year yeah. in the 90s, that last uh, three-peat that they had. And it was essentially a, a year that was just, um, it, it was, they knew that the head coach was going to be, I don't know if you know the whole story about mm -hmm. Phil Knight, they told him at the beginning of the year that mm -hmm. he was going to get fired. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the whole team was like, okay, this is our last dance. This is, right. this is our last time we're all going to be together. No matter what, this is it. And, so, like, the craziness that happened. And it goes through, like, his series of growing up and through the sport, all mm -hmm. the championships he won. And the Scottie Pippins and the mm -hmm. Dennis Rob and, like, just the craziest stories about all of them. But, like, mostly it's about him persevering and holding everybody together when the pressure is, like, right. I mean, Michael Jordan even then. I don't think a lot of people who know who are younger, like, the level of pressure that right. he was on, even at that point point of his career yeah it's and you like, never really see videos or things of him losing his cool exactly yeah just like you know losing it or screaming at a fan or you know screaming at his players he just like always seemed to yeah keep his cool and keep his focus yeah he was he was the drill sergeant of that team and just shows his perseverance and how he pushed them through all that along with all the pressures of life and like i was saying before that this is before social media, but yeah. can you imagine if Michael Jordan came around during a time of social media, how big he would be? Today? Right, right, right. Just insane. So it's it's a really cool, but it has that golf aspect in it. That's yeah. what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, that. yeah, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Well, let's let's um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about the law office too. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about that because I know you, like real estate attorney, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about like when you st when you started that and where it's at today. I started, well, I, I was admitted to practice law in New York originally, oh, 1991, really? okay. and practiced there for a few years. And um, I just kind of fell into real estate because um, I I had a friend who was a real estate broker I went to college with in high school. And I remember um, he said, because um, in, in New York, attorneys handle most of the real estate, not just brokers. Um, most of the Northeast is the same way. So um, he, he asked me, can you do a closing for me, represent some clients of mine who were buying a house? I said, sure, what do I do? And he's just like, you went to law school, didn't you? I said, yeah, but they don't teach anything real, just pra you know, nothing practical. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, well, just hold their hands and try not to give away that you don't know what you're doing. I said, I can do that. So, you know, we're, they're sitting there at the closing and you know, it's a nice old couple and they're passing documents around and all these people there I'd never seen before, never been to a closing. And I'm like, oh, that looks good. You could sign that. You know, I, <laughs> I, honestly, I, I could have been sued for malpractice, but I just figured, look, it was the bank drew up the documents, so they weren't negotiating. So they wanted right. the money. They had to sign them. So I'm like, yeah, standard document, sign that. But it was interesting at the end of the closing, I noticed something, you know, they passing around the checks. So the seller gets a check and the real estate brokers and the, and the title person and the mortgage person. And then I got a check and guess whose check was the smallest? mine i said what's wrong here i'm the most educated person in the room you know and i realized i was just sitting at the wrong end of the table um so i immediately said i gotta 
learn how to do this. Um, and uh, I got into real estate investing and naturally I fell into real estate as an attorney because I specialized in doing creative niche deals that most attorneys didn't understand. And uh, I did that as an investor. I did that as an attorney and got a reputation. How'd you learn that stuff? How you say, cause you were doing things other people weren't doing. How are you learning that early on? Just by trial and error, mostly. Yeah. Mostly. You know, a lot of things were, uh, you know, I was doing residential real estate at first as an investor, but I was borrowing techniques that was common in commercial real estate that people in residential didn't know, especially the brokers. They don't, they have a set way of doing it. You know, the buyer goes to the bank, gets a loan, puts 20% down and, you know, regular closing. Uh, and I was trying to figure out how can I do this without money down and, you know, oh. with creative financing and all these ways that, and most of the brokers in residential is it were clueless. Commercial, it was a little more common. You know, you get more, more, uh, creative things going on. So that's what I started to do. And then I just started to do trial and error and just see what I can get away with within the law. That's awesome. And that's what kind of probably spurred the legal whiz, the whole yeah. name and moniker, right? Yeah. That's an old domain. You rank really high for SEO, yeah. just so you know, because the how old that domain is. Yeah. 96, I think I put that up. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. I had a client in the, he had, he put his website out in 97 and it was like just glow paint, right? Right. Making millions a year on just selling e-commerce right. glow paint. And wow. It was mostly based off his SEO, never needed to advertise. He's always ranked on top of Google, no matter what. Yeah. How the longevity of that domain and how long you've been doing it. Yeah. And most of my traffic is organic. Yeah. It is organic um, for certain things. You know, like my niches, if you search those words, I do come up. And then I have a lot of mini websites that I put up um, that are like a Google search term at that point people, after they read about it, back to my main website. So that that does very well for me. Yeah. And that's, that's a big push of what you're doing nowadays too, right? Um, is the speaking engagements and i've been to them they're freaking yeah, awesome you. we had so much fun we went to uh one last year mm -hmm. and we were just checking it out i was just getting mm -hmm. to know you and uh i don't remember who the speaker was before you but it, mm -hmm. once you came out like and you're telling jokes and like you made the whole concept and the whole um category of real estate real fun and mm -hmm. interesting and humorous and it was just i, I love the way you teach yes <laughs> yeah you've mastered that infotainment you know it's got to be at least half entertainment half information if you just dump information on people they go to sleep right right and so what are some uh what are some like key things that you've learned from your speaking engagement specifically because you've been doing it for a long yeah, time yeah i've been doing it for about uh 25 years yeah. and uh i've spoken everything from you know small audience the one you went to was one of my smaller audiences i i used to speak for get motivated the big business seminars uh, with like 15 16 thousand people at a stadium Gosh. Um, that was terrifying, <laughs> but, um, but you can't really see that, you know, with the lights, you could, you, you're in the middle. The lights are on you, right? You're in the middle. <laughs> you, you could see like the first five rows that say you can't really see the top two levels. So I wasn't that scared when I got on, but before I, I was like, wow, uh, this is, this is serious. Um, but, um, you know, I've learned that you have to engage the audience. Um, you have to hit them, um, in, in their, in, in a level that they understand, they can relate to, that they can identify to, uh, not only intellectually, but emotionally. Um, and if you don't do that, then you just lose them. Also, I found, and this is rather recently, because I've taken some training classes with some NLP guys and so forth, um, you have to change your pace, your volume, your tone, and your style about every three minutes. Otherwise, no matter what, if you're really loud, You'll engage them, but their brain will go to sleep after three minutes of listening. Or if you're really soft, your brain goes to sleep. So you have to change it constantly, the pace, the tone, the volume, you know, your body language, the style. It has to constantly change. Otherwise, you lose the audience. Yeah. That YouTube's very similar, I would say. You got to mm -hmm. make sure you're... You're engaging the audience still, regardless right. if they're digital or in person. <laughs> right. If you just like monotone, to, even as, as good as the information is, people just will click out after a couple of minutes because they just, they're not engaged. Yeah. yeah. Well, that goes the same in a lot of entertainment. We had, um, first and foremost, have you heard of Wirewood Station, the band? They're like a pretty big band here in mm -hmm. Colorado Springs. In uh, Colorado. Yeah. Just in Colorado in general. Yeah. We do a lot of big <laughs> corporate events too, up in like the Gaylord and like mm -hmm. big events. Oh, yeah. Um, 
And the, the gal who heads it, she's like the, the main uh, violinist. Her name's Michelle oh. Edwards. She was on our show. Yeah. But it is it is a f- kind of full time job at times. <laughs> I can imagine. Besides yeah. the performing part of it, you know. So I, I always think for every hour I'm on stage, there's probably a couple hours off stage managing things. You guys are so much fun. Thank you so much. Please check us out. Wirewoodstation.com. And she was talking about early in her career, she moved to Nashville, um, and she was touring with Wayne New- Wayne Newton. Oh, cool. Wayne Newton. And he was, she was talking about like, there was a lot of other A-list guys touring with him at that mm-hmm. time, but the fact that he engaged the audience, yeah, made his thing was... so remarkable and mem- memorable right. for the audience. Like you're talking about, right? Right. Like how many times can you sing Donker Shade? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's just, he's got that personality that he woos the audience. Yeah. It's just insane. So that that's a really good point for sure. I think that's why people really do follow you and you have that like organic following and like, even in the past year, we were just talking about before recording, like how your audience, even on YouTube, is just like, yeah. just tripled. all of a sudden it, it's tripled out of nowhere in the last year. And uh, and and the funny thing is, is I haven't been posting more videos. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I've been still posting them lazily, you know, at a slow pace. But now I'm going to start really, you know, stepping it up. Do you think it's with the need in the market right now? Do you think so? Like this, you know, we're in what September 2023. Is there, is there something, I mean, obviously there's something going on in the real estate market right now. Mm-hmm. Do you think that gauge of like, um, demand of folks looking at, uh, certain topics or certain types of techniques in the real estate industry and the fact that you're speaking to those certain mm-hmm. topics, do you think that's why you're following starting to really blow up or what do you think is really attributing to the, that growth right now? I think that might be part of it, but to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little perplexed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I noticed that there are certain topics that I cover on creative finance, you know, because interest rates now are approaching 8%. If you're an investor, it's plus 8%. It's crazy. You know, so, which actually, you know, when I started in real estate in the early 90s, I was paying 10.75 yeah. as an investor. So I, it's not that big. The people paid 24% interest in the early 80s in commercial real estate and they made money. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that it's, uh, it's hard to cash flow on a rental, you know, when you're paying eight percent versus three mm-hmm. percent. So, I I deal with that issue uh, with some certain techniques that allow you to finance properties creatively with low interest rates and in a high interest rate market, people are paying attention. Let's talk about that. What, what are some yeah. of these techniques that you're you're able to um, and it, without going in course into right. someone buying into your your your, your course or anything mm-hmm. like that, let's talk a little bit more about those techniques. Drop the link. Yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Legalwiz.com is my uh, main website. Um, so if you find, let's say, uh, a lot of landlords are burnt out between COVID and especially in Colorado with all the new anti-landlord legislation, you know, now in the city of Denver has licensing of rentals, inspections annually. It's driving a lot of landlords out of the business. They're just fed up. Mm-hmm. Especially the older ones. If they own the house free and clear, and it's worth you know five hundred, and he bought it for fifty, he's going to have a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar capital gain that's taxable if he sells it mm-hmm. for cash. But if you go to a seller like that and say, "Listen, I'll give you a, a small down payment, and you be the bank and carry the payments. I'll give you a, a promissory note with three or four percent interest," and you pay the taxes over 30 years instead of all at once. Plus you get interest on your money and you get cash flow without the headache of tenants. And if that works for him or her, then I can buy that property without going to a bank and just deal directly with the seller and then rent it out for positive cash flow. I can't do it at 8%. I can't cash flow. Uh, but at 3%, I can. Oh, that's really brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, this is why a lot of folks follow you because you have that, I mean, this depth of experience and understanding like what's legal, what's not, what you can do. And there is a lot of folks out there, uh, like we were talking about just before the show, we don't have to name names, but there are, you know, with any kind of emerging industry and this industry is mm-hmm. in the, I mean, it's real estate, it's been around for a long time, mm-hmm. but there are those kind of fake actors out there yeah. teaching certain types of tactics. So yeah, a lot of good marketers who know a little bit about the topic. Right. And so, like, what's a good cautionary, I get uh, advisory you would tell some of our viewers, like, when they're looking into this and looking into, like, maybe uh, following the right folks to right. teach them the right principles? Well, first of all, you got to look at someone's experience. And in, in real estate, if you haven't been through at least one crash, you don't know anything. 
Um, it, it, it's real easy to be a genius when the market is going up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but if you haven't been through a couple of downturns, um, then you really don't know real estate. I mean, I, I, I've been seeing videos online of kids who look like they're getting their 20s you know, talking about <laughs> real estate investing. And I'm like, you're barely old enough to sign a contract. Um, you, if you haven't been, if you weren't through that 2008 crash or, you know, the COVID thing, or if you have invested in different states, different markets and seen the ups and downs, uh, you really don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And there's a lot of them out there, especially yeah. like we said, access to something like the internet. Right. Well, now everybody's an expert, right? Yeah. They're just, they're, they, it was, what does it do is they're, they're excellent marketers. I give them that I respect that. They come up with cutesy names for things that are really old. Um, and people like, Hey, did you hear about the frog's butt thing, you know, technique? And I'm like, mm-hmm. what? These aren't industry terms. <laughs> These are made up marketing terms, uh, that people are using and, uh, and catching people on the hook, you know, to get them in but with, the, with the promise of instant riches. And they always appeal to people's greed and laziness. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't want to do work. So they're like, Oh, you don't have to do anything. We do it all for you. Uh, and you'll, you'll make instant riches. Real estate is not an instant rich game. I mean, you, you, I always tell people in my seminars, you can't get rich quick in real estate, but you can get broke awful quick if you don't know what you're doing. It's not like investing in the stock market where you just lose your investment. You sign on a 30-year mortgage, no, but you could lose your butt. You could lose everything. Yeah. And a lot of people did in 2009. They you know, filed bankruptcy mm-hmm. to get away from situations where they bought properties, no money down, um, 100% financed, and then the properties drop 30% in value. You're upside down. Just like that too. Yeah. What did they call that subprime? What was yeah, it? subprime lending where yeah. they had, what do they call, uh, they call them non-income verification loans, which means you lie <laughs> yeah. about what you make. They call, we call them liar loans. Yeah. I remember when I was doing a seminar in Vegas, I get in the cab and I'm talking to the cab driver. He's like, what are you here for? I said, I'm here to do a real estate seminar. He goes, oh, I got four properties. I'm like, what? Why are you driving a cab? Because you got four properties. But he, he had bought wow. them all with liar loans. And he expected that they'd go up in value over the next year and then he'd flip them. Well, it didn't happen. Yeah. yeah I'm sure he's still driving a kid. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> that story ended for him. Gosh. So how do you navigate, like like, like we're talking about with these people? And, and like, I'm sure a lot of your clientele speak of those people mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. How has that changed the landscape of which you, you deal with a lot of your clientele? Yeah. It's hard because uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to run bad mouthing people by name. Yeah. Uh, I, I more like bad mouthing the techniques that are being taught uh, and people can figure out who it is. Um, so I just have warned them, especially when it comes to like documents and contracts and you got to know uh, what's the local customary contract rules, mm-hmm. regulations for your state when someone is teaching from another state and doesn't know what the rules are in your state. You know, because they always say, well, we have forms, but you should have a local attorney review them, but nobody does. Or they come to me and I tear them apart and they don't want to pay me. <laughs> I'm like, well, you paid him 10 grand. You know, what do you want me to do it for free? And do all the, do like, do those, um, those state laws, do those change all, like every single year as well? Or how often do they change? A lot. Landlord tenant laws change pretty quickly, but, you know, general contract laws and things like that are, yeah. tend to remain the same. Okay. Uh, disclosures, mm-hmm. you know, what you're required to disclose and things like that. You have to be aware of that. And that's like your, one of your biggest pieces is like the real estate attorney piece to what yeah. you do too, huh? It really helps you. I mean, obviously the, the legal part, cause there are those, those right. fake actors out there who are right. not real estate attorneys and they're just approaches right. from someone who's maybe made one thing work and it might not even be the most legal, but now they're like, Hey, I found something and I'm yeah. going to share it with the world. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you know, even I, as an attorney, I mean, my courses I sell, they have for, and I've researched in other states, you know, what are the rules? And I have a lot of state specific forms, but I still say, I don't discourage you from having a local attorney review this right? because there might be some little, you know, hiccup or some kind of rule in a local jurisdiction that I'm not aware of, or something has changed that you, you have to know. Gosh, have to know. So true. And let's talk a little bit, a little bit more about your, your, your clientele. Um, what, how old are they? Um, how much do they make? Let's talk about some of, some of that as well. In my law practice or in my- No, just specifically those who come to your speaking engagements. Oh, it used to be all men. Yeah. You know, the real estate used to be an old man's business. I remember when I first started the real estate club in the 90s, 
it was all old cranky landlord men. <laughs> um, now it's it's probably more than fifty percent women. Um, awesome. And my, my for a long time, my typical customer was you know forty something or fifty something engineer, because I the way I explain things, engineers seem to follow the logic. Okay. Um, so I got a lot of engineers who are making good living, maybe making one hundred fifty grand a year. They got a four hundred one k. They're doing pretty well, but they say, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I want some passive income. I want to spend more time with my family. And they become very good customers. You know, they have, A, they have money, but B, they, they, they're intelligent enough and they see the bigger picture. Um, you know, a lot of these online gurus appeal to, you know, the person who doesn't have two nickels to rub together. Um, but if you buy my $10,000 course, you don't need any money to buy real estate. And that's true. You can buy real estate without money, but you can't be in business without money. I mean, you have to have money. There was a there was a guy in the uh, 80s and 90s named Carlton Sheets. Um, he was actually a friend of mine. Really good guy. We used to live paycheck to paycheck. paycheck we no longer paycheck. have to worry about paying the bills. The money's there. Welcome to The Good Life, Getting Yours. Presented by self-made millionaire and world-famous author of More Money in Your Pocket, Carlton Sheets. He's a man who in 1970, deep in debt, was fired from a dead-end sales job and has since skyrocketed to fame using a unique system of building great wealth starting with nothing. His story has appeared in many major newspaper and magazine articles and he, along with his students, has been a featured guest on numerous talk shows and documentaries. He used to market a course on TV called No Money Down and like all these ways to buy real estate No Money Down. It was a great course. And, um, but the problem was, what he never really taught you was, what happens if you buy 10 properties, no money down, and you have four vacancies that month? You have to have that cash reserve. Okay. So you don't need money to buy the properties necessarily, but you need to market. You need to you know, fix a, something that breaks suddenly. You could have a bad month. Um, so you, you really you know, really need some money to be in business. Right, to pay the mortgage at the very least. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a crazy game for sure, and it's so good to have someone like you that has so much experience in that game. But for those who are younger, twenty uh, something, thirty something year olds who maybe like us entrepreneurs, I have a condo that I got uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of kids or like it, a lot of people my age that don't have properties. W what's mm -hmm. some advice that you would give them to kind of get started into the real estate yeah. industry? So I'm, now I'm seeing a lot of twenty, you know, a lot of millennials, twenty and thirty year olds. Um, all of a sudden getting into the business, which is great. I, I love to see it early because I got started in real estate in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and my only regret is I didn't keep more. You know, I flipped a lot to make money, mm -hmm. you know, to pay the bills, but I, I should have kept more. Because the price yeah. went- Because the price, you know, those $7,000 houses I bought in Denver. <laughs> I remember there was this one block where there was like a four houses attached to each other, like, you know, um, like a townhome style yeah. that I could have bought for 5,000 each. They were all boarded up. And I went, 20,000 bucks. Can I tie up 20,000 bucks for a couple of years like that? And at the time, I, I passed on it, but that, that's, that's a million five now. Mm -hmm. I, it's unreal. Um, but I, what I'm, I like to see people young getting into real estate uh, early and buying at least their own property um, or maybe a duplex where they can live in one half and rent the other half or maybe a house that they can buy with three or four bedrooms and rent out to roommates and that'll cover their mortgage. You know, the, the earlier you get in, time works for you. Mm -hmm. Real estate markets go up and down, but in the long run, they do go up. Mm -hmm. So if you have time, time is on your side. You know, even if you make a mistake, time will fix it uh, in real estate. So the earlier you can get in, the better. Yeah. And that's the hard part for a lot of young people is yeah. understanding how to get in, especially if they don't have like a fixed income, if they don't have right. an engineering type of salary, if they're... Um, you know, it's it's harder, um, especially when I was first starting on with my businesses because um, I wasn't S corp yet. Once I went S corp, that was good because then I had mm -hmm. that proven income and I was a W two mm -hmm. employee of my own business. Right. I had that like, I had that W two. I just give to somebody and right. hey, here's my income. Here's what I, here's my salary. Right. That made it a lot easier. But for a lot of folks, I mean, especially now, there's a lot of young people who are just trying to start their own business. It's really hard to get into the real estate market, yeah. especially with these rates. Well, if you're if you're going to go borrow from banks, which I haven't done in 15 years. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, what I described earlier, getting a seller to carry a loan, and there's dozens of other techniques like that, which don't require a credit report. It doesn't require, you know, a certain minimum down payment or a FICO score. Um, 
and and that's how young people can do it. You know, maybe borrowing a down payment from your grandfather or your uncle or your parents or you know someone like that, um, or you know doing a partnership with one of your family members or cousins or friends or coworkers. So th- there's ways to do it. You know, I would say if you find a good deal, the money finds you. You know, that, that that's really the principle. People focus too much. Well, I don't have any money. Well, you don't need a lot of money to make money. You need to learn how to do deals that people go, wow, I want in on that. And I give an example in my seminar. I said, you know, if, if there was like a one-year-old Honda Accord parked in back that you could pick it up for 20 grand, that'd be a pretty good deal, probably worth 30 or 35. You know, how many people think they can come up with 20 grand and only a few people raise their hand? I said, I got a Maserati parked out back and um, you can have that for 40 grand. Everybody raises their hand because they know that's a $300,000 car. So you couldn't come up with 20, but you can come up with 40. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the deal was good enough. Mm -hmm. With better the deal, you could call somebody. You could, you know, bribe, beg, borrow, and steal to find that 40 grand for a $300,000 car. So you find a good enough deal, people will fund you. That's such an important piece because I don't. I think a lot of people don't know that, like that yeah. there are creative financing techniques, mm-hmm. and that's why there's folks like you out there who have the breadth of experience. Be like, no, this is the legal way. This is all legal. What I'm doing, by the right. way, you don't have to go to the bank. You can do these other creative financing right. techniques, all legal. You know, dotted I's, cross T's. Mm-hmm. It's so important for people to know that. And yeah, especially young so people. Few. So yeah. few. I mean, maybe of the real estate population, real estate investor population, probably three percent of people know the stuff. Most of them know. Watch the TV shows. You buy a house, you fix it up, you sell it, or you buy a house, you fix it up, you rent it. Go to the bank, you get a loan, or in the case of a fix and flip, you could they, they have private money lenders called hard money lenders who will lend to you at high interest rates, but it's only a few months, so you make it work. All right. Well, we have a, a serious question for you, and I mean, you could put, it's just not really much pressure to it, but what do you think is going to happen in the real estate market in 2024? Or maybe just the end of this year going into 2024? Yeah, well, 2024 is an election year. Yeah. So in election years, governments tend to prop up the economy that's the incumbent. Yep. So they're probably going to do whatever they can to make things good, look good for them. Right. So they'll probably put pressure on the Fed to not raise interest rates anymore. Um, probably going to engage in policies that'll keep the stock market looking good. So I don't think the real estate market will change much. I mean, right now the, the market, it's a neighborhood by neighborhood thing. You know, people think um, there is a housing market and they talk about it on the news. There is no housing market. It, it's it's local. Mm-hmm. It's not like gold where it's the same everywhere, <laughs> you know? So real estate is city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And and within, you know, Colorado, uh, I think, you know, Denver is more people moving in than moving out. So that's supply and demand. Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Boulder, all the same. So the market will pretty much stay where it is, which is some neighborhoods are flat, some neighborhoods are still great, and some neighborhoods are softening. Uh, and I think we'll see, we'll continue to see that for at least another year. That's that's awesome, and it's so cool because uh, my mom. I mean, she's never done real. She's never been an agent, never any of that, but she's always picked the right places. And we bought in. Mm-hmm. Uh, any any of our listeners who know Colorado Springs specifically, but Northgate, we bought it in 2003 oh, yeah. and like it's almost quadrupled right. in value since 2003, right. which is just insane. And again, like good uh, 3,000 square foot house, which is a smaller house in that area, mm. um, which is good, right? You want to have a right. smaller house. Well, in the the- right. And it's just so cool to see because like you said, it's even through everything, it's always kind of trickled up in that area and i don't see anything stopping especially with all no. the stuff they're putting in that area it's a real estate is all about supply and demand. i was an economics major in college so i understand supply demand that's uh, all these other factors they talk about are nonsense right it's supply and demand and right now supply is extremely limited mm-hmm. because number one um uh, builders just can't build fast enough right. to get materials fast enough um and number two there's only you know there's only so much water available to build new subdivisions and 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 really a lot of sellers um who bought three or four years ago or more and have three percent mortgages are not getting the price they want so they're just pulling their listings off mm-hmm. and they realize if i sell my you know six hundred thousand dollar house where am i going to buy another house at a bargain and i'm not going to want to pay seven or eight exactly, percent yeah so there's there the people who were trying to sell last few years have 
pulled their listings and they're waiting for the interest rates to come back down again so they can get a higher price. And in the meantime, they could either just live there or rent it out because they've got a 3% mortgage. So there's just the number of homes for sale remains extremely low. Because of that. Because of that. Yeah. So you're an ec- economics major, you said. Mm-hmm. Um, so you probably have a really good grasp on a supply and demand. For a good clip for this, could you break down supply and demand a little bit, like on the right. fundamental level? Yeah. So the, the number of houses for sale versus the number of buyers looking. Okay. Uh, that, that the latter being demand. Okay. So uh, what drives supply? Uh, we've talked about some of those factors. Mm-hmm. Demand is driven by more people moving in than moving out um, and interest rates. So mm-hmm. when interest rates went up, the number of buyers went down because it's your payment basically doubled. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that has hurt. But even though demand has dropped, supply is so low. I mean, normally in, in Denver Metro, for example, a normal supply would be like 25,000 homes for sale. In 19, uh, excuse me, in 2008, we peaked at 35,000 homes. So it's too much supply and that's why we crashed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been below 5,000 homes for the last 10 years. It's gotten as low as 2,500 homes. I mean, that's like one-tenth of normal. So supply may have dropped you know, 80% and demand because of interest rates maybe dropped 30%. Mm-hmm. So that's what's caused the market lately to sort of come to a halt. It's not dropping, but it's not really, it's not going up, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not going up, you know, 10, 15% a year as it was in 2019, 20, 21, and so forth. That's, yeah. And the COVID thing, the surprise was I thought COVID was the end. I thought COVID would kabosh the real estate. Market. Yeah. It did the opposite. It did, yeah. <laughs> it did the opposite because. Everything was shut down for a year and yet all this pent up demand. And then when they reopened things, it went crazy. And, you know, checks coming to people for yeah. working. So they got yeah. they got to store up some capital, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, what lessons do you think are, are learned from that? Like, <clears throat> like you just can't predict. It's hard to predict. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things. It's hard to predict, you know, what's going to happen. I mean, you could. it's not like the stock market where you wake up one day and go, oh my gosh, Iran has a nuclear weapon, the whole world changed and the stock market drops 300%, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's possible, 300%, 30%. Yeah. <laughs> um, but real estate, it's slow. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you could see the writing on the wall and, you know, things don't move that fast. It's like a big ocean liner. You know, it doesn't, you could see the slow turn. Mm-hmm. 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 And like if an iceberg comes, you know. Type right. You, you have enough <laughs> warning. You could yeah. see that. I mean, I mean, most people, not most people, I'd say a lot of people, who were experienced saw the crash in 2008 coming. Mm-hmm. You know, supply started going up and interest rates and lending practices tightened up. You could see that. And that's another thing that affects demand is lending practices. Mm-hmm. So the harder it is to get a loan, the fewer buyers can buy. That affects that affects demand going lower. Right. Um, they're starting to get more flexible on lending again to, because a lot of people won't borrow. And so the lenders are going, we'll make it a little easier for you. Uh, they're starting to do these NIV loans again, you know, income verification, liar loans. Um, some letters <laughs> are, allo- you know, allowing you to borrow with, you know, 5% down, 10% down instead of 20% down. So I even heard like a 1% down in a specific mm-hmm. area in Arizona, which is mm-hmm. like a 1%. What does that even mean? A 1% right. two grand for a quarter million dollar right. house. And also government policy, you have um, veterans administration loans. Those are no down. Yeah. Uh, those, but that's a small percentage. But FHA loans are three and a half percent down, and if they if they make it easier for people to qualify for those, more people will use those loans, mm-hmm. which will go into default, and we as the taxpayers will pick up the tab. But yeah, <laughs> because it's a risky loan. And know? what's the FHA? FHA is the Federal Housing Administration, uh, which ensures a loan. So normally a lender wants 20% down because of risk. So the government says, if you lend them with 3.5% down um, with a low credit score and very high debt to income ratio, we'll back that loan up if it goes into default. Wow. So lenders are doing these risky loans for low income people um, and they default at a much higher rate because they're not putting as much money down and the qualifications are looser. You only have to have like a 580 credit score to get an FHA loan. Wow. That's crazy. That's pretty nuts. That's pretty nuts. Oh, gosh. 
So what do you think? Um, cause you've, you've been in Colorado Springs for like a year now or less mm-hmm. than a year now. About a year now. Yeah. What, what, what's the landscape of the Springs versus Denver? What's the future for both cities? Cause they're both growing cities. Yeah. Um, Colorado Springs market is very tight, l- lack of supply. Yeah. Um, so what you're seeing is people going east mm-hmm. towards Falcon. That's hot. Mm-hmm. They're going south to Pueblo and Pueblo, which was forever a dump. Right. Um, now it's a semi dump. Yeah. No, no, no insult to anyone who was watching, but you know. Whoa, Pueblo, Colorado. My dad said, you know what? You want to be a comedian, son. Well, if you can get people to show up in Pueblo, Colorado, you made it. And we're here in Pueblo, Colorado. It's in the top 10 most violent fucking. <laughs> I just want to make you guys laugh. 30 people were killed here last year, okay? And I'm just here to make you guys laugh. And 30, and there's 100,000 of you. <laughs> 30 people that means you guys have to walk around like this there is straight up nothing to do here except get murdered maybe there's some nice neighborhoods in Pueblo West Pueblo West Pueblo West number Pueblo four West, on right. most cri- uh, the most uh, crime in the nation is it really yeah mm-hmm. is it really well per um, capita but <laughs> p- prices have popped there yeah. yeah and rents have popped there because people will drive a half hour 40 minutes because uh, they can't afford to live in Colorado Springs anymore right oh yeah no Northgate too. Yeah, Northgate's crazy. Yeah. And the whole area north, those houses, you know, a million plus. I mean, yeah. people drive to Denver from Colorado Springs, the same similar commute. Comes yeah, well, I do. Uh, you know, I live on the north end too. Um, and so I, my office is in the tech center. So I drive about 40 minutes. I, I try to avoid rush hour. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I only go maybe two, three days a week, but it's about a 40 minute drive. Yeah. There's it's, people that fly from Denver to call oh, the Springs really? airport. I see, I see these little, I live by the airport. So people, people will like, that's their daily commute. My uncle, I'm from Kansas city. So my uncle, Ooh. he, he had an airplane for a long time and he would fly to wherever he needed to like just short commutes just to save. Cause I mean, you don't have to go on the track. His own plane or? Yeah, his own plane. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably faster to drive than go through security. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, he had his own little plane. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it matched his Corvette. It was pretty yeah. cool. Was oh, great. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I did a, uh, I went on a private jet once out of, um, the Centennial Airport in, nice. in Denver, yeah, uh, t- over to Telluride, and it was the scariest flight of my life. I mean, it was a there. six-seater, you know, and you're going directly into the headwinds, and it's <laughs> and then the the, the airports on the mountains too. Yeah, I'm like never again. <laughs> we were just at Telluride last weekend. We're like, who the heck flies in and lands on top of a mountain here in Telluride? I guess you did once upon a yeah, time. I, <laughs> it, it was scary. <laughs> we yeah, do that again. Yeah, this, those planes can. Yeah, those kind of, you hear like at least a few times a year <clears throat> that one of those kinds of planes have crashed. You know, now the only you know, the only way I'd ever have you know a private jet was it has to be like the size of Trump's, you know, because otherwise <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm not flying in a little plane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Well, this has been a really good episode. Uh, before we close everything up, what where are some things that uh, you you would like for us to promote on the show? My main website legalwiz.com. I have hundreds of articles and videos there for free. Um, my YouTube, it's just YouTube slash my last name, Brown Chick. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a couple of hundred videos there on real estate investing. I'm going to show you in this short video how you can set up your entities in real estate investing for maximum protection, maximum privacy, and minimum taxes. Um, and then my law firm website is brownchicklaw.com where you can see what I do there. Love it. Well, this has been awesome. Is there any last uh, questions that you have, Andrew, before we wrap this up? No, I think it's, uh, this has been a great episode. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Bill, for coming oh, on the show. Fun. And, fun. Yeah. This is this has been awesome. Very insightful. It's There's so much that we could... I feel like we could talk for hours about all the different <laughs> things that you've done in like, your life. It's just a very fruitful life and just yeah. it's awesome seeing you soar. Awesome. Yeah, this was great, man. great. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are great interviewers. Yeah.